Stop and you think about everything we hold of value on this planet, metals, minerals, energy, real estate, the things that nations fight wars over. These things are in near infinite quantities out there. Uh, if you believe that the developing world deserves the same standards of living that we do in the developed world, then to achieve that, they need resources. They need the metals and the minerals to build the industries and the buildings and so forth, and the energy. And the question is, do you continue to rape and pillage Earth? Or if you had the ability to extract that information from the outside resources, outside of Earth, then that would be a mechanism to uplift the bottom billion or so of society. The other thing is that there's a concept uh, that a friend of mine, Elon Musk, and I talk about backing up the biosphere. You know, go back to ancient history and when the libraries of Alexandria burned and all the knowledge was consumed in those flames. Today, we have built this pinnacle of information, both in the biosphere, encoded in the genomics of plants and animals and the billions of species on this planet, and in the internet, where we've digitized languages and information and images and so forth. You know, the right size asteroid coming in to smack the Earth will destroy all of that. So we have today literally the technical capability to back up the living Earth, if you would, back up Gaia uh, digitally and to go and sequence the genomes of not billions, but millions of species and take that information and duplicate it off the planet such that if anything ever happened, it's resident there and preserved forever. Uh, that sort of capability comes with it a tremendous moral imperative in my mind of being able to implement this. So those are some of the reasons to uplift society and to back up the biosphere. And the third and final reason is it's in our genome. We are as humans exploring species. You know, we began in the plains of Africa and our need to explore that took us into Europe, into Asia, across the Straits, into the Americas and so forth that drive to explore is resident in our DNA. In fact, it's genetically, if you would, selected for because those who explore and move out the widest and furthest have the least chance of having their genome, you know, destroyed by a local accident. And so that is a uh, evolutionary imperative. We're not going to stop here on planet Earth. We're going to move out to other planetary bodies and not I believe not going into the planetary, uh, you know, gravitational wells will build societies and in, in uh, you know O'Neill-like spheres, and and humanity will move out into the cosmos and probably meet other societies that have done the same in millennia and eons past. Something very interesting has happened over the last hundred years that people don't think about, which is that the frontiers that we have have started to shrink and disappear. It used to be that 100 or 150 years ago, if you screwed up, you know, you fucked up literally in one area, you're, you could go and start again someplace new. You could go and, and start your life again without the stigma of what happened. There's no place you can do that again. There's no real frontiers. So that ability, the second thing about frontiers are it allows the individuals who are best, whether they're men or women or minorities or whatever, to, to step up to the top. So in traditional societies, you know, old world societies in the, you know, the United Kingdom, if you would, if you were born into the right stratus, the right class, you had the ability to succeed. But if you weren't, you were stuck. And in the frontier, it didn't matter what your birthright was where you went to school, what you did. If you were the best, people came to you. So that's some of the elements of a frontier. And finally, in space, what's going to happen is the chance to truly uh, explore in different societal structures. If you want to practice a pure capitalist state or anarchy or socialism, whatever it is, you can gather the people around you who want to, you know, to form that type of government and go and create your own space society off on some colony and go and practice that. And those who don't like it can duplicate the uh, genomics and the knowledge 
systems of that colony and split out and do it again. There will be a Darwinian evolution of different forms of society and different ways of people trying it. But you know, go and try and start your own government here in the United States today and you'll be squashed very quickly. One of the precepts of the X Prize is you get what you incentivize. A very simple concept that's extraordinarily powerful. And if you look to the root of what the problems are, you always find out, well, we don't incentivize that. Today, what we incentivize, we incentivize uh, you know, a congressman be elected every two years, a president being elected over four years, and a senator over six years. So it's what's going to affect people right now. You know, what can I promise and deliver in two years? Space is not a two-year objective. It used to be in the early 60s. We had this eye candy of Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. Every year we would do something more and more, and it, it met those needs. But the easy stuff's been done. You know, and today NASA calls stuff nominal instead of phenomenal like it really is. So you know, I've given up that, uh, that you know, there's going to be a balance, and NASA's going to do certain things. And we are finally in a state of existence where small groups of individuals can do extraordinary things, funded by single people. You know, today a group of 20 individuals empowered by the exponential growing technologies of AI and robotics and computers and networks and eventually nanotechnology can do what only nation states could have done before. We saw this in the first X Prize that we put together, the Ansari X Prize, where Spaceship One, built by a small team of 20 individuals at Scaled Composites, led by Bert Rutan, funded by one individual, Paul Allen, did what you know, only the United States government could have done 40 years earlier. We see that more and more coming up. You know, I'm a nine-year-old kid inside, and my passion has been all my life to want to travel to space. I, got, you know, I drank that Kool-Aid. I got that bug as a kid. Um, I saw Apollo going on on TV. I was born in 61. And, I believed it was going to happen. I believed that we were, you know, once we got to the moon, there was no stopping us. But in fact, we did stop. And, you know, it's been literally 40 years uh, since we've been to the lunar surface. And I ended up realizing that NASA was unlikely to get me into space or get me to the moon or beyond. And I needed some other way to drive this. And I became very much, uh, if I have to describe myself, I'm a sort of a libertarian capitalist, and I was looking for what's the economic engine that's going to drive us into space. So I w received a book one day from a great friend of mine, Greg Marinak, called The Spirit of St. Louis, that tells the story of Lindbergh. And I had no idea that Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic to win a prize. I thought he woke up one day and just decided to go east. But in fact, there was this Frenchman born in Paris, came to New York, you know, with pennies in his pocket, uh, uh, Raymond Ortega was his name, became a busboy, moved up, eventually bought the hotel he worked at, started in the second hotel. And just after World War I, when aviation just started getting going, he became enamored by this idea of aviation, and he decided to put up a prize for the first person that could go nonstop between his birthplace and his, his new home in either direction. But if you knew about the trade winds, you'd go east. And as it turned out, nine different teams from around the world, mostly the US, mostly France, went after this. And the nine teams spent $400,000 to win this $25,000 prize, 16 times the prize money. I'm going, oh my god, and I'm making notes in the margins about how much money is being spent. Uh, Admiral Byrd, the first guy to fly to the North Pole, for example, spends $100,000 to try and win this $25,000 prize. And, he crashes on takeoff because he overweights his, overweights his airplane with champagne in China to celebrate when he lands in Paris as if there would be no champagne in China in, in Paris when he gets there. And the most unlikely guy to do this, Charles Lindbergh, who'd been flying the mail for just a handful of years, makes this effort. No one would sell him an airplane. No one would sell him an engine because he was unproven. You know, who is this guy? I mean, for God's sakes, we don't know who he is. I'm not going to, you know, he's going to kill himself and set back aviation a decade. Well, of course, he does just the opposite. He makes the flight. 33 and a half hours later, he lands in Le Bourget, and he becomes famous overnight. And still today, you know, all school kids know his name. But what hit me was not the efficiency of this prize, which was amazing, right? You put up 25000 you get $400,000 spent 
to win it. But that within 18 months of Lindbergh making this flight across the Atlantic, something miraculous happens. We go from, in 1927, where there were 6,000 paying passengers in all of the United States, and people who flew in airplanes were called aeronauts and daredevils. This is uh, Eric Lindbergh, Charles' grandson, who's a great friend on our board of trustees who tells a story, went from going being aeronauts and daredevils, 6,000 of them, to 18 months later, where they were passengers and pilots, and there were 180,000 of them. You know, this 30-fold increase, this, uh, this, this prize caused this, you know, dramatic change in the paradigm. And that inspired me to create the Ansari X Prize for spaceflight. And uh, so that's how it got started. So one of my goals is to reinvent philanthropy. You know, today philanthropy is a very unsophisticated, uh, old world process where, you know, people who make a shitload of money go and give it away. And, you know, they're, they, when they're making their money, they're focused on 10x, 100x returns on the dollar. Every dollar they use has got to be basically leveraged. But when they go and they give their money away, they're happy with 30 cents on the dollar, 10 cents. Oh, they really tried hard. Too bad they didn't do it. That's ridiculous. You should command and demand the tenfold leverage on your dollars when you give it away as well. So we look for areas that are stuck, you know, where there's a stigma, where, um, where there is, uh, uh, you know, people have given up that there can be a solution for it. You know, in the, in the space business, space had gotten very much to be the aerospace industry. This is something that governments only do, and it's for the Boeings and the Lockheeds and the Northrops and so forth. And there's no way these small companies could do it. The automotive industry in the same way. So these industries have become old age and they become, you know, osteified. They can't innovate themselves out of a paper bag sometimes. This is where putting up a clearly defined measurable prize that says to the world, I don't care where you've gone to school, what you've ever done, you do this and you win. And it brings really orthogonal thinking to the table. People who don't have the degrees, people who would never get a National Science Foundation grant because they don't have the you know, imprimatur or haven't done the research, but they may have the most brilliant idea because they're not stuck in the way they think. It was Henry Ford who said, you know, an expert is someone who can tell you exactly how something can't be done. And that's true. We bring prizes together in a number of different ways. Um, first of all, we have our board of trustees who we've built very carefully. It's a, a large number of really self-made innovators. Uh, you know, Larry Page, Dean Kamen, Elon Musk, uh, Ratan Tata from, uh, uh, from India, uh, the Ansari family that funded our first Ansari X Prize. Um, incredible uh, individuals. And then we have our vision circle, which are our largest benefactors. Uh, these are individuals uh, like uh, Sergey Brin and, and uh, Eric Schmidt, um, again, the Ansari family, um, uh, Stu Blusson. And these two groups, our board of trustees and our vision circle members, get together twice a year with us. And we have a visioneering session. And for two days, we debate and we discuss what are the world's biggest problems? Where are they stuck? You know, from uh, diagnosing tuberculosis in three hours from in remote areas to uh, diagnosing cancer early to mapping the ocean floor or trying to deal with the ocean plastics issue or reinventing education. And we debate and we discuss what would make a great X Prize. We have our X Prize labs. Uh, we have an X Prize lab at MIT, at USC, at University of Washington, and IIT Bombay. And these are interdisciplinary graduate level programs where young students who don't know what's not possible come up and say, let's create an X Prize around this area. And then uh, the staff, the senior staff that really is constantly thinking. So whenever I'm meeting somebody, I'm interviewing them and saying, what do you think a great X Prize would be? And brainstorming it with over lunch. Um, so that's sources for ideas. You know, at the end of the day, uh, the people who end up funding our prizes are corporations and philanthropists. And they end up 
literally, you know, if you're a venture capitalist, you're interested in moving a technology forward, you've got to choose your horse ahead of time. So you're going to, if you're interested in water technology, energy, energy technology, you get to choose between the three or four companies that you have insight into. And you have to make a bet on them before they prove anything out. And you don't know about the other hundred out there that might have much better technology. And it seems really silly to me to do it that way. When you put up a large incentive prize, you get the entire world. So it pulls out of the woodwork all hundred companies. And you get to see them all. And you automatically back the winner. So, you know, for me, it's a very logical, it's highly leveraged. Ten, typically 10 to 50 fold the amount of money you put up, you get spent by the teams to win it. Um, you're creating a brand new industry and you have full industry insight. And in the winning of the prize, you create a brand new marketplace that then is buying the product that you incentivize in the first place. You know, Paul Allen, who backed uh, Bert Rutan uh, in a recent interview with, um, uh, with uh, Dave Moore, who ran uh, Paul Allen's venture here, you know, Dave said that uh, you know, Paul Allen invested somewhere between 20 and $30 million dollars and that he got probably, you know, five or 10x the money back by backing it in terms of the licensing rights and the tax deferrals and the technology they had developed and the media and so forth. So in this time when, you know, money is tighter and tighter and tighter, you know, we believe that incentive prizes are an extraordinarily efficient way for companies to drive breakthroughs in their industry, You've got companies like Netflix and Cisco and others creating incentive prizes inside their company or in their area to drive, you know, to say, ask yourself the question, do you have the smartest people in the world working for your company? And if you do, you're lucky. But if you don't, put up the incentive. You know, we get what we incentivize and cast it out to the world and have someone who's absolutely brilliant, who's, you know, a 22-year-old in India who says, what about this way? And who revolutionizes the way you do business. We become stuck in the way we think. We have to. We, as you know, the leader in the field, um, has been doing what they do all of their lives. And when someone comes in with something that is extraordinarily risky, they have a lot to lose. And so their willingness to take the risk is very low. But when you bring people in who've got nothing to lose. They're literally willing to risk their lives. That's where breakthroughs come in. The day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. So the question companies have to ask, or governments have to ask, is where do we allow crazy ideas to bubble up? Because if there's a failure, what happens? Someone gets blamed. There's a lawsuit. There's a congressional investigation. And so those things shut down the creative engine. One of the people uh, who have a tremendous uh, level of, uh, uh, of gratitude for and, uh, uh, and excitement about is Ratan Tata, the chairman of Tata Industries. You know, they give out an award every year for the team and their company that took the biggest risks. That's going to drive innovation. So you get what you incentivized, and I do believe that the best way to predict the future is to invent it yourself. So that's what we do. We drive people to invent the future they want to create by incentivizing it. One of the companies I co-founded is a company called Space Adventures. Uh, and we are the only company to date to have flown people privately to space. We have flown eight passengers to the space station uh, going up on uh, the Soyuz. Uh, Dennis Tito was our first. Uh, Richard uh, Garriott, who's the chairman of Space uh, Adventures and a, and a trustee of the XPRIZE Foundation, first, second generation astronaut. And our, our latest uh, was uh, Guy Le Liberté, the founder and uh, CEO of Cirque du Soleil. Uh, these people spend about $45 million to go up for 10 days to the space station. Incredible experience. Uh, if we could buy a seat on the shuttle, which we cannot, uh, the cost per seat is probably $100 million on the shuttle. So the Soyuz is is somewhat, somewhat cheaper. If you went uh, and we had a super efficient system, the cost I think you'd ever, the closest you'd ever get down is probably in the four or five million dollars uh, per seat 
uh, using existing propulsion systems. If your whole system was reusable and if you flew it on a very frequent basis. But if you go and you do the energy calculations of how much it costs to put you and your spacesuit into orbit, you know, a high school physics student can do this. It's, it's easy. It's mass times gravity times height to get your uh, potential energy and then one half mv squared to get your kinetic energy. And um, if you do that for you and your, in a 200 kilogram spacesuit, turns out the total energy spent over an hour is about uh, 1.6 gigajoules. And if you bought this off the electric grid at, a, at 7 cents a kilowatt hour, the cost of getting you and your spacesuit into orbit is about 120 bucks. So the price improvement curve ahead of us is 45 million to 100 bucks. That's a pretty big motivation. I, you know, I'm not naive enough to think that we're not going to have amazing physics breakthroughs. I mean, technologically, we've been a technological species for 100 or 200 years, depending on where you, you measure that. So I think there is much we do not know. But in the near term, uh, I'm betting on a technology which I think is very doable today. In fact, I'm in the middle of talking with a, a number of benefactors about creating an X prize around this concept. It's called beamed power propulsion. And the concept is today rockets haven't changed in the last 2,000 years since early Chinese rocketry. You have a tube, you burn something inside, and the hot gases come out one end. That's, you know, they've gotten bigger, more expensive, more elaborate, more efficient, but they're still the same basic concepts. So one of the X prize ideas that I'm excited about um, that I really want to have is called beam power propulsion. The way it works is you have a source of energy in the ground, either lasers or probably microwaves. And that system is getting more and more efficient every year. The price to generate a megawatt or a gigawatt of energy is coming down year after year. We're learning how to print it, make it more efficient. And what you do is you beam the energy to the rocket, and the rocket basically converts that energy to heat and heats up a working fluid like hydrogen, and then the hydrogen goes out the other end. Um, that can reduce the cost of space flight by 50 to 100 fold, and it's technology that could be done right now, but no one's doing it because no one's doing it. And that's where an X Prize really comes in uh, if you can demonstrate something just enough. Like, for example, with the original Ansari X Prize for space flight, we demonstrated a ship carrying three people up to 100 kilometers twice in two days, and then Richard Branson comes in and you know, says, I'd commit a quarter of a billion dollars to commercialize that technology. So I'd love to demonstrate beam power propulsion, and once that's demonstrated enough, then new technology will come in. Every prize that we design has to meet certain attributes. Number one, clear and measurable. Three people, 100 kilometers. 100 mile per gallon or its equivalent car, you know, with X parameters. Sequence 100 human genomes in 10 days. The second thing is it has to be addressing a grand challenge. It has to be something which could have a paradigm change on the back end. The third is if it's properly designed, when it's won, the world is paying attention and it ignites a new industry. For me, the fact that Branson was there committing the money and all of a sudden people started buying tickets, you know, there have been over a thousand tickets sold to fly into space, was what made this really exciting. Uh, yes, Spaceship One is hanging in the Air and Space Museum right above Apollo 11 next to Spirit of St. Louis. That's great, but the fact that we have an industry going is what makes it awesome. So, the other thing is I'm looking for prizes that are winnable in three to eight years, in X prizes. If it's less than three years, it was too easy. More than eight years, no one gives a shit anymore. The other thing, though, is we are now creating something we call X challenges. X prizes are these bigger $10 million or more. The X challenges are million dollar level prizes that are more winnable in a year or two years. They're about moving technology forward in, an, in a demonstrable fashion. Uh, the paradigm I want to change is that you can have a car that is beautiful, manufacturable, affordable, safe, fast, and oh, by the way, it does over 100 miles per gallon, or it's energy equivalent. Why wouldn't you? So we put out this competition. We had 135, 136 vehicles registered to compete. We whittled it down out of 51 vehicles. There will be a few winners. Uh, 
And at the end of this, besides having a few winners, three winners in particular for the Progressive Automotive X Prize, my goal is there's a new generation of cars. And people can say, we're living in a new day of age, a new day and age of cars that are beautiful, affordable, safe. And of course, every car gets over 100 miles per gallon. Why wouldn't it? So that's a game changer, a change in the paradigm, a change in the kind of cars that we drive. Another game changer is another X Prize I'm itching to get launched, and it's the Autonomous Car X Prize. I think 100 years from now, people will look back and say, really? People used to drive their cars? What are they, insane? You know, humans are the worst control system to put in front of a car. You know, we have these 100 millisecond delays, you know, we, our attention is on our PDA, we're, you know, we're always in a rush. You know, we drive around uh, in these 4,000 pound metal wombs, you know, these 4,000 pound containment systems to protect us from these 6,000 pound cars from smacking us. And, you know, I'm going to buy a, uh, you know, a uh, you know, large SUV because I'm scared about the other SUVs. I'm going to buy this small little car and get slammed. And, of course, they're right in that regard. But if we can build autonomous cars that are so smart and so sensitive to what's going on that they can't be hit, then you're thinking. When cars have the sensory systems around them, GPS intelligence, they're looking at the world not only in visual spectrum but infrared and ultraviolet and everything else that's going on, and they've got reaction times in you know, microseconds, not, you know, not a tenth of a second they're you know, 100,000 times faster, then you're talking. Three things come out of it. Today, there are about 2 million major injuries, 50,000 loss of lives in the United States alone. You'll get rid of those, first and foremost. If you care about saving 50,000 lives, that's one option. The second thing is cars will get a lot lighter because they're not worried about it. So you, know, you don't need 4,000 pounds. 1,000 is plenty. And if you're carrying around, you know, the idea of a you know, a, a young, thin woman who weighs 100 pounds driving herself around in a 4,000-pound SUV is laughable. So she doesn't need that. Um, 1,000 pounds is plenty to give you all the accoutrement in the room and, and such. So you reduce the energy usage by a large factor. And the third is, when all these autonomous cars know where all the other autonomous cars are, they can fan out and they take the most efficient route to get you from one place, and you got rid of traffic jams. Eventually, frankly, no one's going to own a car. What you're going to own is on your PDA, the ability to say, you know, I need a car from here to here, and you can say, I need a car now, in which case they'll charge you a premium, or I'm willing to pay 50 cents for that drive, in which case the car willing to take you 50 cents, or I need a Ferrari because I'm on a date. And you've got this panoply of cars that you can choose from and you, you will own the ability to command transportation, not the need to have a car. So those are the futures there. Department of Energy has come on as a major partner for the Progressive Automotive X Prize, uh, and I'm extraordinarily thankful to them for that. Uh, I think that there is a lot more that the government can do, but it's a start. Uh, the idea of of starting to envision the rules and regulations to allow for autonomous cars is a hard one to think about. When, we ha when I did the Ansari X Prize originally, the rules and regulations to allow for private space flight didn't exist. You know, you could not legally put a human and fly them into space. In fact, you couldn't bring a spaceship back. All the space vehicles we were sending commercially to space were, were one way. You know, you sort of like got rid of them. And most passengers who go up do want to come back down. Uh, so we had to go and change the rules and regulations, and the, and the momentum of the competition allowed us to do that. So I imagine there will be new rules and regulations on the autonomous car X Prize. And I didn't mention what some of the two ideas for the autonomous car X Prize. One is uh, the first car to win against a top-seeded NASCAR or IndyCar driver. So it's really you know the the deep blue. Um, equivalent from the you know, chess world in the automotive space. And the alternate would be the first car to go autonomously from LA to New York in under three days 
obeying all the rules and regulations. I'm going to have a heck of a time going through state lines and local police and all of that. But anyway, those are two concepts. Looking for, again, a dramatic demonstration of autonomy showing itself to be far more safe than worrying about whether the person on the street next to you is texting or has had a drink or is paying attention. What can go wrong is that we can become landlocked. Uh, you know, one of the things that's going on right now is that we have this uh, amazing debris uh, cloud in space, uh, orbital debris as it's called, where you've had anti-satellite weapons blowing up satellites, you've had old satellites decommissioned, uh, left in orbit, uh, and other satellites smacking into them. And every time there's a collision, hundreds of parts break off. And these, these components are traveling at 17,000 miles an hour. So they're, you know, much faster than a speeding bullet. And there reaches a point at which all of this debris starts to grow exponentially. And we will literally have this, we'll be locked in. We're sending a spacecraft up to space to get through the debris cloud. We'll be taking your chances. So solving that is another X prize that we've talked about. Um, one of the other major things, I think, to really incentivize and open the space frontier, we need to allow for ownership. You know, what opened up the America West? It was the fact that you owned the real estate, you owned the gold mines, the oil wells. You know, the creation of these, back then, million-dollar million dollar industries drove the railroads and eventually even the airlines to provide this kind of transportation. So I'm extraordinarily passionate, for example, about the idea of asteroid mining in the future. Uh, the asteroids out there, uh, we know them from those that have fallen on the Earth. There is a class of asteroids, uh, a subclass of nickel-iron asteroids, which are 50,000 times more enriched than platinum mines on Earth. Extraordinary wealth that can be created. The first trillionaires we made in, in space. The question is, do we have the structure to allow for the ownership of these? If we do, or when it's finally created, uh, we will have really the impetus, the real market creation, that will cause billions to be invested privately in space transportation to gain access to the trillions that are out there.